Melbourne. Melbourne Cricket Ground to an Australian, the MCG. The place where Australia first played England. And where they meet again with room for 100,000 people to watch them. To mark the centenary of what Australians insist is the only true test cricket, Australia against England. It's a history as rich, diverting and profound as the men who made it. Much of that history preserved here in the Memorial Gallery at Lord's. And it's shown a pattern of character as well as skill. And as those who played in it have realized, it's always played desperately hard. Holly pitches the ball up slowly and he's bold. Appealing to the umpire, and Emirates Davis has given him out. Now he's hit him for six. And I think uh, the storm signals are up. And that's four. And look at Greg now, signaling four for himself. All that was history yet to be made and totally unforeseen when the match subsequently recognizes the first test took place in March 1877. It was a spur of the moment affair. James Lily White's England team were the fourth tourists, a party of mercenaries who, like their predecessors, played matches against odds, local 15s, 18s, and even 22s. But some of those Australian sides had won, and their pressure for a representative match on level terms was undeniable. So a fixture known as a combined New South Wales and Victoria 11 against all England was hastily arranged for the return of the England team from New Zealand. England were without their regular wicketkeeper, Ted Pooley, who'd been left in prison in New Zealand on charges arising from betting on a match and a scuffle over payment. His deputy, Jupp, had inflammation of the eyes due to various reasons, and the stopgap, Selby, simply was not a wicketkeeper. Australia was short of three of their best bowlers, including Spofforth, known as the Demon Bowler, who wouldn't play without his own wicketkeeper. The Australian selectors, not for the last time, refused to give in to player power. The match was decided by two men, both Australians. Charles Bannerman took the first ball of the first test match and went on to make 165 before he had to go off with a split finger from one of a sequence of short-pitched balls from Elliot. So the bouncer began with the first test. England needed only 155 in their second innings to win, but the fast left-arm bowler Tom Kendall, in the finest performance of his life, took seven for 55, and Australia won by 45 runs. The principle of matches between the two countries had been established. The outstanding cricketer of this era, W.G. Grace, wasn't on that 1876-77 tour, but he had previously taken the team to Australia, and he made his mighty mark on the first test match played in England at the Oval in 1880, when his 152 helped England to a five wickets win. His brothers, E.M. and G.F. Fred, played for England too. And the poignant footnote to this match was that the younger brother, Fred, closest to W.G. in feeling, and reckoned potentially to be a great player, on his way back from the match was put in a wet bed at Basingstoke and died a few days later, and that after making a pair of spectacles in the test match. WG played against the Australian team of 1882 that at the Oval inflicted on England their first home defeat, an incredible shock to all cricketing England. It was the only test of the season. England needed just 85 in their second innings to win, but Spofforth, with his fast off breaks, took seven for 44 and Australia won by seven runs. Hungary beating England at soccer was nothing compared with the shock this gave. It seemed incredible. As a result, the Sporting Times printed the now well-worn obituary of English cricket with the footnote that the body will be cremated and the ashes taken to Australia. So, when an English team led by the Honourable Ivo Bly followed hard on the heels of the returning Australians, it was popularly said in England that he was going to recover the ashes. Australia won the first of the three planned matches,
but then England took the next two, and two Australian ladies burnt a bale, put the ashes of it in this urn, and presented it to the Honourable Ivo Bly. Thereupon, the Australians demanded, got, and won a fourth test match. But Bly kept his urn, and married one of the ladies who created it, and now, irrespective of who metaphorically holds the ashes, this urn remains always here at Lord's. The period to 1900, in fact, is very well epitomised by the medallions and the painting of a fictitious England-Australia match by Barrable and Punsonby Staples. The medallions show a ranking of great players, English and Australian, who sustained the procession up to the end of the century. Although the match never took place, the players shown in it did play in test matches. England are batting and W.G. Grace has just played a ball over to Garrett at deep extra cover. On the right are Edward VII, as he was to become, and Alexandra, and just to make Edward feel at home, the artist has painted in seven of his loveliest lady friends, including Lily Langtree. So the long story of mythology ran on. The period around 1900 threw up Victor Trumper, still, I suppose, the best loved of all Australian cricketers, a brilliant batsman, good enough to score 100 before lunch in a test match, who once, at the request of a backcountry lad, went into bat with a crude homemade bat and made 80 with it in a Sheffield Shield match, just out of the spontaneous generosity of his nature. Monty Noble, or Alf Noble as they sometimes called him, of New South Wales, magnificent technician of cricket, skillful captain, tough batsman, and a match-winning bowler. Warwick Armstrong, ponderous batsman, the bowler who introduced leg theory with round-the-wicket rolled leg breaks that his English opponents found it almost impossible to score from, and unbeaten as a test captain, he was certainly the toughest Australia ever sent to England. Who did England have to set against them? Primarily, I suppose, the greatest of all English bowlers, S.F. Barnes, Sidney Barnes. And when Tiger Smith, his wicketkeeper, said to him, I suppose, Sid, you bowl everything except the googly, he said, I never needed the googly. He bowled from fast to medium, moved the ball through the air off the pitch, and he virtually won the test series of 1911-12 in Australia off his own bat. On figures, he's the greatest bowler England ever had, and nobody who played with him or against him ever disputed that fact. On a par with him in the other department, the Edwardians would have put Jack Hobbs, Sir John Berry Hobbs, the man who effectively broke down the barrier between amateur and professional only by wishing to be a professional with his own rights. A man who made more centuries, 197, than anyone else has ever made in first-class cricket. A kindly, gentle creature, and still by the testimony of those who played with and against him, the greatest of all batsmen in all conditions. He made his rounds with such an air of enjoyment, such effortless grace, as no one else has ever really matched. Yorkshire would put up two men with him, George Hurst and Wilfred Rhodes, the two great all-rounders from Kirk Eaton. And the cricket world of his time might prefer Wilfred Rhodes, who rose from England's young slow left arm bowler batting at number 11, to go in first with Jack Hobbs and set a new record for an opening stand in an England-Australia test. He was the model slow left arm bowler. Spin, flight, length, control, strategy, and he made himself into a highly successful test batsman. The crown of his career was when, at the age of 48, he came back to play a major part in winning that final test of 1926. halfway through the century of England-Australia test cricket and somewhere in that rather balmily delighted crowd at the test match was a little Hampshire boy, grubby, excited and hungry, having eaten his sandwiches too early, wholly involved but only half comprehending 
that he was seeing the making of cricket history. He's grown up now, old enough to remember the tests of the remaining half century and to feel over again the emotions that many of these matches aroused. Now, uh, that side with the heroes of a generation went on to win in Australia in 1928-9. But in 1930, Don Bradman effectively won the series in England for Australia. When Douglas Jardine took his side out there in 1932-3, he'd worked out a strategy which he believed would defeat Australia. He'd come to the conclusion that Don Bradman was vulnerable to short-pitched fast bowling on the line of his body. He took out a side that was able to deliver it. They did deliver it. Harold Larwood of Nottinghamshire, extremely fast and unusually accurate for his pace, was the main weapon in what was to be known as body line. It was supported by Bill Vos and Bill Bowes. What the Australians called body line was, in fact, bowling short on or outside the leg stump, demanding a catch to one of the cluster of short legs from a batsman who fended the ball off his body. In the first test, Bradman was unfit, and only Stan McCabe, with a characteristically brilliant 187, effectively resisted the England pace. For England in this first test match, three men made centuries. Herbert Sutcliffe, coolest and calmest of all test batsmen, the completely unruffleable. Walter Hammond, at his greatest, batted like a splendidly casual but mighty prince. And the Nawab of Bataudi, who in fact was a prince, and did his best to bat like Walter Hammond. Larwood, established by that series as a supreme fast bowler, took ten wickets and won the match for England. So to Melbourne in the second test. Bradman fit and before a vast crowd, out the first ball to Bill Bowes. But on an unusually slow wicket in the second innings, Bradman made the century that won the match for Australia and levelled the series. Then to Adelaide. And by now all Australia had been roused to anger by body line and even England was becoming aware of the atmosphere of the series when it went to see the newsreel in its own cinemas. It was a tightly packed round that saw England take the field for Australia's first innings at Adelaide after having put 341 runs on the board themselves. Singleton partners Woodfull to the wicket who opens the scoring with a single off Allen's first ball. There is an early shock for Australia when Fingleton is caught off the second ball of the match. It was at this point in the game that Woodfull was unfortunately struck on the heart by a ball from Larwood which got up. No one in England, though, realised quite the intensity of the passion and the anger in Australia. The Australians didn't like body line at all. I know that it affected the players very much indeed. They are in a state of physical and mental exhaustion because it was uh, no nice thing to have a ball whistling past your ears and past your temples because we knew that if we had been hit by one of those balls, we'd either end up in the slab and the mortuary or an imbecile for the rest of our lives. Larwood is faster today than ever, and this slow motion study reveals his action very clearly and bowls to a leg trap to which Bradman falls a victim when he has only scored eight. None of the Australians seem able to deal with the leg theory bowling with the exception of Ponsford, who is pulling the game round to his side. Oldfield is now his partner, but the English players are very distressed when he is struck on the head. 
Larwood again being the unlucky bowler. When Wall is bowled, the Australian innings closes for 222 runs, 119 behind England's total. And England eventually win one of the most sensational cricket matches ever played by 338 runs. The anger was reflected in newspaper headlines, in books that were rushed off the presses there, and in the cables that passed between the two countries and were referred to cabinet level. Bodyline bowling assumed such proportions as to menace best interests of game, making protection of body by batsmen the main consideration, causing intensely bitter feeling between players as well as injury, in our opinion is unsportsmanlike, unless stopped at once, likely to upset friendly relations between Australia and England. We, the Maranaban Cricket Club, deplore your cable. We deprecate your opinion that there has been unsportsmanlike play. Much as we regret accidents to Woodfall and Oldfield, we understand that in neither case was the bowler to blame. We hope that the situation is not now as serious as your cable would seem to indicate, but if it is such as to jeopardise the good relations between English and Australian cricketers, and you consider it desirable to cancel remainder of programme, we would consent, but with great reluctance. Relations between the cricket authorities of the two countries were stretched almost to snapping point before peace was restored and the Australians came to England in 1934. Jardine, tactfully and with a sardonic grin, had retired. Larwood was the sacrificial lamb to appeasement. He bit his tongue on his resentment, kept silence and, 17 years afterwards, emigrated with his family to Australia. The first test, the Trent Bridge Test of 1938, was one of the glorious and historic draws of all test cricket. There'd be no record of it at all, but that a Nottingham amateur cameraman went up there and filmed it. Perhaps not in the sophisticated manner of the present day, but nevertheless he filmed a quite splendid cricket match, in which Don Bradman brought his team into the field after England had won the toss, and everybody there watched a series of great innings. First of all, Charlie Barnett of Gloucestershire all but scored a hundred before lunch. In fact, Glenn Hutton, the junior partner, decided he might get out taking a risk to complete the century and ensured that he didn't get the bowling but had to wait until after lunch before he hit the four that took him into three figures. As for Len Hutton, 21 years old, he made 100 too in his first test against Australia, and he was to make more. It was a characteristic, cool, bland, calm Hutton century. Dennis Compton, a year younger at 20, scored a century as well in two and a quarter hours. And it was his first test against Australia as well. So these two, together, gave indication of English cricket history to come. Eddie Painter, surely the most underestimated and unlucky of all English cricketers, 36 years old, made 216 not out. And England declared at 658 for eight at a quarter past three on the second day. Not a bad scoring rate. When England, under Wally Hammond, fielded, Stan McCabe played in innings which prompted Don Bradman, watching it from the balcony, to go back into the dressing room where some of his team were playing cards and say, come out and look at this. You may never see its like again. Jack Fingleton was one of those called out to watch that innings. McCabe was a brilliant batsman. He worked on a minimum of foot movement. He made up his mind very quickly, and as soon as he did, he moved into it with a minimum of effort. His footwork on this occasion was beautiful. He hit Ken Farns, I remember, into George Parr's tree outside the uh, Nottingham ground, and he treated all the English attack with supreme and utter contempt.
Stan McCabe's 232 took Australia to 411, but it wasn't enough to avoid the follow-on. Still, Brown and Bradman saw Australia safely to a draw on that wonderful batsman's wicket. This, as it were, brings Bradman's technique into closer. The speed of reaction, the certainty of stroke, that cool, complete mastery. So the two sides went to the oval for the final test, with Australia one up. England hadn't won a test series against Australia since 1932-33. The young Len Hutton, now 22, in an innings of quite monumental concentration, went steadily on his way to break Bradman's test record. He made 364 before he was out. Today I think has been one of the happiest days of my cricketing career. I managed to, to beat Don's great record and I must say I felt very pleased when I achieved it. Bradman had to be carried off when he cracked an ankle bone. His team was defeated by the biggest margin ever known in a test of an innings and 579 runs. But ten years later, at the age of 40, he was back in triumph. It seemed that war had bred an immense nostalgic enthusiasm for the game in England, and everywhere they went, huge crowds welcomed Bradman and his undefeated team. And at Leeds, he showed once again that the most efficient of all run makers was virtually as productive as ever. He led Australia in scoring 404 runs in less than a day to win. If it wasn't quite the Bradman of the 30s, it was still magnificent and built up the enthusiasm for the Oval, one of the great nostalgic moments of modern cricket. The Don's farewell. Here's the applause for Bradman as he comes in. Well, it's a wonderful reception. The whole crowd is standing, and the England team are joining in, and led by Yardley, three cheers for the Don as he gets to the wicket. And now here's Hollies to bowl to him from the Vauxhall end. No run. And Hollies pitches the ball up slowly, and he's bowled. Bowled to that bowler's lifelong delight by Eric Holly's little googly. Was Bradman's eagle eye dimmed by a tear after that moving reception? Jack Fingleton, who was sitting in the commentary box, said that if it was, it was for the first time. He'd failed, actually, by 0.06, or just four more runs, to average 100 runs per test innings. England had to wait until 1953, 20 years altogether, before they won the Ashes. And nothing can have been more appropriate than that two of their three historic batting figures of the age, Dennis Compton and Bill Edrich, were together when the winning hit was made. A very quick one. Morris might at least get a run out of his over, but no, he... Won't get a wicket, so it's another one to Bill Edridge. 55 to him, England 128 for two. And four runs needed. Now, will this be got in one stroke? Or four runs to get. Just... No, is it? Is it the Ashes? Yes, England have won the Ashes. Len Hutton, the first professional to captain England in a home series, had many strains to contend with, not only batting against a hostile Australian attack, nor the tactics of astute Australian captains, but some often unreasonable social stresses in his own country. I do hope you've enjoyed watching uh, uh, the matches and listening to them as much as we have <laughs> playing in them. That must have been the finest English team for 30 years, one of the strongest they ever had. Jim Laker. Great day was yet to come. Tony Locke, Alec Bedser, Tom Graveney, Godfrey Evans, Fred Truman, Trevor Bailey, as well as Compton and Edwards. This was such a vintage crop that England left out three of their key bowlers of the period, Fred Truman, Tony Locke and Jim Laker, for the 1954-55 tour of Australia. And still they won the series, due mainly to Frank Tyson, 
Liverpool rising to the absolute peak of his career, effectively won the series. Richie Benner had no doubt at all about his pace. I can't believe there's ever been a faster bowler in the history of the game than Frank Tyson was in that 1954-55 series. Jeff Thompson, perhaps, in the last couple of years has bowled as fast, but in Sydney on a green top and in Melbourne on a broken pitch, it'd be a physical impossibility to bowl any faster than Tyson did in that series. If his 28 wickets were the main contributing factor in England winning the Ashes in that series, then an even greater individual contribution came from Jim Laker with his 46 wickets in the 1956 series in England. Ten in an innings against us uh, when we played Surrey at the Oval, 19 in the Old Trafford Test match. And sit back, you English cricket lovers, and enjoy this. First to go is Colin McDonald. He's waiting, and Emrys Davis has given him out. Yes, I thought he must be out. Good luck. That's the beginning, and Australia's 48 for one becomes 48 for two as Harvey is clean bowled by Laker. Ooh. Yes, he bowled him, stump. Laker's Surrey teammate Tony Locke helps with one wicket, but then it's Craig, LBW, Laker. Yes, he's out, LBW. And without adding a run, Mackay is out. Court Oakman, bold Laker. <gasps> and he's caught by Oakman. They're appealing to the umpire, Emery Davis. Give him out. Australia, 62 for five. And there's no stopping Laker. Keith Miller goes next. Court Oakman, bold Laker. 73 for 6 becomes 73 for 7 as the Australians collapse. Richie Benno has a go, but he too becomes a victim of Laker. And he's going to be caught by Statham. Archer is Laker's next capture, and then Maddox is bold Laker. Eighty-four for nine, with Laker bowling himself into cricket history. And he makes sure of it by bowling Ian Johnson, and so takes nine wickets for 37 runs. Something no Englishman has ever done before against Australia. And as Australia follow on, Laker is at it again. Once more, it's Harvey, bold Laker. Next day, during a brief spell of play, it's Burke, bold Laker. Laker to Burke. Caught by luck. Rain robs Laker of further glory, but on the last day, he's back, and Craig's out, bold Laker. Yes, I should think so. Yes. Now comes the breakthrough. Mackay has caught Oakman, bold Laker. Oakman. Next to go is Keith Miller, out for a duck, bold Laker. And he bowls. Victim number six is Archer, caught Oakman, bold Laker. Oakman. All this time, McDonald is batting well, but when he's hit 89, he too becomes bold Laker. Seven wickets so far to Laker, and now it's Benno. Bold Laker. We bowled him. 198 for eight, and all eight bold Laker. And 20 minutes later, Linville two falls to the leg trap. Bold Laker. He's, he caught him. Is he? Is he out? No. Yes, he's out. He's given out. Waiting for the appeal. Can Laker get all ten? That's the question everyone's asking as he bowls to Maddox. Yeah, he's out! Ten wickets to Laker. And it's Australia, bold Laker. He's taken all the I believe the other remarkable feature of this test match was that Tony Locke, who was a, a superb bowler, in actual fact bowled almost 70 overs and came out of the match with figures of one for well over 100. Well, he didn't bowl all that badly. I think it was just one of those occasions where everything went right for me and nothing at all went right for Tony. But surely it epitomises the game of cricket. Jubilation on the one hand and utter despair on the other. There must be qualifications about most outstanding cricketers. 
But about Jim Laker, you can say simply that while the off-break has been practised since cricket began, he's the best off-break bowler there's ever been. After 1956, the Australians won the Chuckers series in Australia 1958-59, and in 1961, the decisive moment of that rubber came surely in the fourth test at Old Trafford. England led by 177 on the first innings, and when Australia, in their second, were 334 for nine, with David Allen spinning steadily through their batting, England undoubtedly had a chance to win. At that point, Graham McKenzie came in to join Alan Davidson, who promptly mounted an attack on David Allen. Only's hit him high into the outfield for six. Over extra cover. He hits that high for six. The decisions that David Allen off in the face of that punishment proved the error of judgment that eventually cost England the rubber. Still England could have won if they'd got 256 at 67 an hour, and with Dexter in full flow, that was not impossible. England need 141. They're right up with the clock. That's gone through, and there's his 50. Ooney's hit him into the crowd down. Magnificent shot over long arm. You can very rarely put a finger on two or three minutes of a test match that completely resolve it. But you can of this game, at the point where Dexter and Subber Row had reached 150 for the second wicket, and Richie Bano decided to bowl round the wicket into the bowler's rough. These days, uh, there's no rough for the bowlers to bowl into, but uh, at Old Trafford that day, the holes were wide and deep. I decided to bowl round the wicket to the right-handers, providing they were attacking. Wasn't much point in doing it otherwise, because they could have played the ball away with their pads. He's got behind the wicket. Dexter caught behind by Grout off Benno for 76. Benno bowling round the wicket may possibly be a little bit difficult to get away. Uh, he's bowled May behind his legs, has he? Yes, he's out. Bowled behind his legs. And the picture changes with a vengeance. He sweeps at that one and it goes most briskly for two runs. Well, words fail me. Doesn't seem any sort of reason for this sort of approach at all. You've only got to get just over a run a minute. Brian Close was unfairly slated for his innings, but as far as I was concerned, he was a real menace once Dexter had been dismissed. Now he's hit him for six. And he's caught behind square leg. It's almost inevitable. Oh, magnificent catch by Simpson. What a fine catch. So that's Alan out, caught Simpson Bell Benno for 10. England still. 55 runs behind. Stays on the batsman, not out eight, facing Davidson. Team ball. Australia have won and they've kept the ashes. This, in many ways, was the greatest achievement of Richie Benno's career. It was a triumph not only of technique and of spin bowling, but also of character. Australia were threatened with defeat and Benno went on himself to change the course of the game and win it, and he did it. Trafford has the reputation for rain, but in 1968, rain at the Oval precipitated as remarkable a sequence of events as it's ever done in all Test cricket. A storm at lunch with Australia 85 for five seemed to have put an end to any chance of play. Then, so far as anyone knows without parallel in the history of Test cricket, volunteers, scores of them, came out of the crowd and mopped the pitch up to make it fit for play. The Australians, I suppose, might have queried whether this was even legal, but they didn't. 
then they had to hold out for 75 minutes to avoid defeat. And Jarman and Inverarity had lasted 40 minutes of that time and five bowlers as well, when Dolivero was brought on as the sixth to bowl to Jarman. He's out. Well, there we are. There's the first wicket. Dolivero has got it. An involuntary sort of shot from Jarman. Seemed to me he was withdrawing his bat too late. So he's out for 21, six wickets down. Now Underwood at this end to bowl to Mallet, who batted for three hours in the first Australian innings. He's out, caught. Caught by Brown. So Mallet is out, second ball. Three to get. Well, there was once a test match at the Oval when somebody bit through the handle of his umbrella, and this is the kind of cricket now. And the wicket looks as if it's beginning to bite and not taking that in the chest. Cowdrip must be pleased at the grip that Underwood got there. Ten men round the bat. Doesn't matter about the fours or sixes, runs don't matter at all. Ooh, he's out as he caught. Look at Brown, look at Dave Brown, he's gone. And that was a better catch. Oh, what a day is Dave Brown having. And Underwood too. So it's, this is Gleason's first ball now. And different tactics, and that's going to be four runs up to the corner there by the gas holder. See the tenseness in the faces there. Even little Alan not normally always laughing. Very grim. Coming in round the wicket this time, Underwood. And he got him! Bowled him! Off stump, knocked out of the ground. And Australia are 120 for nine with just one wicket to go and ten minutes and a half left. Inverarity has been there for four hours, ten minutes. A superb innings for this country. <laughs> Appeal, he's out! He's out, WW! England have won! And the series is drawn. There's Colin Cowdery, the happiest man on the field. So, thanks to Derek Underwood, England drew the series. But one other individual performance in that match was to have even wider repercussions, quite outside the normal realm of cricket scores in the Test series. Basil D'Oliveira, Cape Coloured from South Africa, was not entitled to play Test cricket in the country of his birth. He'd come to England, become a British citizen, and been capped for England. In the first innings, he made 150, and then, as you've seen, bowled the ball that made the breakthrough that enabled England to draw the series. Nevertheless, he was left out of MCC's team to go to South Africa that winter, but was brought into it when an original selection, Tom Cartwright, proved unfit to go. As a result, the South African government forbade the tour, and no cricket has been played between England and South Africa, nor will be until South Africa's cricket is played on a non-racial basis. Donavira, though, was one of the 1970-71 team that Ray Illingworth, another professional captain, took to Australia. After three draws, England won at Sydney, due almost entirely to the individual performances of two of the most controversial figures of English cricket of the last 15 years, Geoffrey Boycott and John Snow. In the fourth test, the Yorkshireman Geoffrey Boycott made 77 not out in the first innings and 142 not out in the second. This was the batsman of ultimates, even by Yorkshire standards. A player of immense concentration, attempting constantly to make his batting impregnable. He didn't quite succeed, but he came nearer to it than most. And the bowler in the second innings, John Snow of Sussex. A turbulent current and a genuine streak of hostility and immense ability as a fast bowler, took seven for 40, which gave the match finally to England. There were two more draws afterwards, and then the sides went on to a quite unique seventh test at Sydney, where England had their problems. Boycott couldn't play through injury, and very early on in the match, they were in trouble. Snow was bowling to Terry Jenner. That brought a warning from umpire Rowan. 
fusillade of beer cans from the crowd. And with John Snow hurried by spectators, Ray Illingworth took England off the field, only to bring them back when he was told that if they stayed off, the match would be awarded to Australia. At the beginning of the last innings, Australia simply needed 223 to win and retain the Ashes. Snow got Eastwood out, but then he broke his hand on a boundary fence and it seemed that England's and Illingworth's chances had gone. And it's Lever bowling to Ian Chappell. There's an appeal for court behind and he's out. Chappell is out. Court not bowled Lever for six. Australia two for 22. The problem that England now faces is quite simple. Can their bowlers swing this game? without the help of John Snow. There it goes. That's the shot way out and long on there. Maybe six. That's a tremendous hit. Six runs. Where's that going? It's out towards Dolavira and he won't get to it. All right of him. Four runs to stack time. Is he caught? Yes, he's out. Red Park, caught Hampshire, Bold Illingworth for 14. Now for Walters, three slips in the gully. Last ball of this over from Willis. And where's that going? Is it out to the boundary? Who's there? Out. Caught. Caught by Dolavira. Oh, that's it. That's four runs. Beautifully timed shot from Stepfold. And the field of court and he's bowled. 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 He's bowled. Well, that bowled him round his legs, so Stackpole is out. There's trouble for Australia. A vital wicket for Illinois. So Australia started the final day, needing another hundred to win and save the ashes, with Greg Chappell and Rodney Marsh together. this sweep shot that he likes to play so much. Stackpole was out yesterday playing the sweep shot when he was bowled by Hillingworth, hit his leg stump. Bowled him. Bar shooting right across that one and he is out, bowled Underwood for 16. Australia six for 131. Now this is the last ball of the over. Will Greg Chappell try and get the strike? Where's that going? It's over the head of the mid offer. Well played. Four runs. Greg Chappell. Measured aggression. Now Illingworth to Greg Chappell. Stumped. He's out. Yes. Well bowled Illingworth. Chappell. Stumped. Not bold Illingworth 30. O'Keefe not out one. Australia 7 for 142. And Illingworth has 3 for 28. Dolavira to O'Keefe. Could be out court. Yes. O'Keefe is out. Caught at uh, Backward Square by Shuttleworth. Australia 8 for 154. Miss Dolavira bowling to Lily. And he's out court. Billy staying there. Yes, he's out. Billy not at all happy with that either, it appears. In fact, he's looking at the fieldsman as he goes out. Jenna facing Underwood. And that's it. Is it. Yes, he's out. That's the end of the match. Raymond Ellingworth was the first English captain to regain the Ashes in Australia since the Bodyline Tour of 1932-33. And Bodyline, in most countries, seems to be used as a term of abuse when it's directed against them. And it came up again on England's next door. That's courtesy. Let's see what happens here. He's out. Yes, he is out. But, um, I would... Hazard a guess that uh, when Tony Gregg came to the batting crease, 
that he might be the recipient of one or two shorter pitch deliveries from Dennis Villa. The controversy that followed, a number of people argued, not completely without justification, that England had fired the first shot in that battle. There was, too, a body of opinion in England that thought after Lilly's back injury and with Thompson, an unproved bowler with an indifferent test record, the Australian fast bowling was nothing to be feared in 1974. That theory was soon blown up. And appeal this time, he's walked, he's out. Brilliantly caught by Marsh. Luckhurst caught Marsh, bowled Thompson for two. And in the air, uh, what's that, is he out? He's out. Amos, Port Jenner, Bowl Thompson for seven. England, two for ten, exactly the same position as Australia. And Thompson has two for four. Walker, bowling to Dines. And that's four. Square cut for four. For LBW, he's given out without playing a shot. The Ness, LBW. Edridge is 17, two sundries, and England are three for 33. And they'll play it on, he's bowled. Fletcher bowled by Lilly for 17. And I think uh, the storm signals are up. I think uh, Lily has intimated to Greg what his intentions are. Lily bowling to Greg. And that's four. And look at Greg now, signalling four for himself. And that could be his hundred, it's wide of Walters. Walters coming around very quickly, and he can't get to it, there's his hundred. Greg's century couldn't mask the English batsman's deficiencies against real pace. The conclusive evidence of that came in the second innings of that match. And caught by Ian Chappell, a first slip. Thompson to Edridge. Thompson to Amos. Chance, and he's out. Caught by Walters. Thompson bowling to the Ness. Caught by Walters. Thompson bowling to Greg. Oh, bowled him. Yorked him, leg stump. And the jubilation from the Australian team. Leave it 13. And that's in the air, he's out. Caught by Redpath. Thompson to not. Bold. Bold. So Thompson and Lilly established a pattern of domination that lasted through that series in Australia and another in England. While Lilly's recent performances against Pakistan argue that he at least is still a considerable threat. The injury to Thompson's shoulder, well, as the Australians used to say, that leaves the situation open for another Australian fast bowler. So the camera has strained its memory as far back as it will go and then come up to today to record a century of that particular kind of cricket which has roused a vast number of people to suspense, delight, excitement, pleasure, even anger has roused in some emotions so intense as to make one wonder whether this form of cricket is really a game. Thank goodness it is. Yes, he's out, LBW. There it goes. That's the shot way out and long on there. Maybe six. It's a tremendous hit. Six runs. And he got him. Bowled him. Off stump, knocked out of the ground. Oh, bowled him. Yorked him. Leg stump. Is it, is it the Ashes? Yes, England have won the Ashes. 